Don't you love the worship team? And don't you love even more the God we worship? I'm serious. Yeah, they deserve. Come on. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah. I'm going to, I, I've taught from Jonah for, for many times over the years, and I just find there's so many things that we can walk away from in the book of Jonah. So just go there and wait for a second, because I got 15 minutes. <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to take, but I got about, I, I, I got, I've got a, a, I want to share something I want to share with you today. It is, it's just this, this idea of compassion that we, as the church, God has placed us on the earth to actually be him on the earth. Get that. He, when, when, when England sent uh, boats over to settle this land, uh, they didn't send it over to become the United States of America. I've shared that with you in the past. They actually sent people over to create a new England. He, they, actually, uh, they actually settled people here. They, they took from them, and they placed it in a new land to become the new England there. And so what happened is when God has filled us with his spirit at the cross, uh, God actually, or at the resurrection, actually because his resurrection power is what empowers us to walk in his faith. But when God gave us a new life, he empowered us with his spirit to be a new Jesus on earth. And I want you to get that picture. Christ it's, it, it, we've said this many times uh, because God's word teaches that I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but it's Jesus Christ who lives in me and through me. And God empowers me to live the what? We've taught it here for years, the Christ life. Because the life I live, I hope that my goal is every day is less about me and more about Christ. And so I, I, I look at the, for the believer, it's an opportunity for us to, to really express who Jesus is. And I'm in restaurants. I address this every once in a while, and I'm going to readdress it today. I'm in restaurants. I'm in public places all the time where there are, there are individuals that love to profess their, 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 their Christianity. And, and, they, and I mentioned it last week. I saw somebody not long ago actually bow their head in prayer not long ago, and then, and then they actually began to, 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 to actually ream and speak harshly to their server. And, and I'm sitting there going, Wow. I mean, I just want to go over and say, don't bow your head and pray. Don't, don't do that to the rest of those believers that actually know God and want to make God known. I, are y'all awake? Are y'all following me? I want, I, what I want to talk with you about is Christ's compassion for man through us. And I think there's a great example of that in the book of Jonah. Because I, if you know the story of Jonah, and, and, and some of us knew it, we grew up, here, here's the sad thing. Some of us grew up in, in, this is the great part, some of us grew up in church and learned the story of Jonah. And many today will walk up to me through the years and say, when I, I'll say something like, you know the story of Jonah, I'm not going to go through all the details. I've actually had people walk up to me and say, Pastor, don't ever skip a story detail. Because I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know God's word. I never learned What's the thing about Jonah and the big fish? And I never realized, see, I was raised in a church where when our pastor said, everybody turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah, everybody knew all four chapters and all the events of that book. But there's a world that we are supposed to be reaching that do not know Jesus Christ, have not been raised in church, and when we talk to them about Jonah and a whale or a big fish, whatever you want to, you know, most of the scriptures say actually big fish, he created a big fish, we assume people believe that story. And in fact, there are actually churches today that instead of teaching it as the account of Jonah, they'll teach it as the tale of Jonah. Because they do not believe that God's Word is the inspired Word of God. We do. We believe it is the perfectly inspired Word of God and that it is true. Unless it says this is a parable, unless it makes clear that it's a story of an example, this is a true account of, of Jonah's life. Turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1. We're going to cover all four chapters, though I'm not going to read all four. I, want to t I love telling the story because it's, it's fun to tell. I, I saw, what was the kids' version of that again? The... the, the Ma what, what? Veggie tales. <laughs> it's not the same story. It's not quite the same story as Veggie Tales. Believe me. I had to, first time I saw that with our kids, I was like, "That's cute." <laughs> <laughs> 
That's not quite what happened. Anyway, the, let's go with chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amatai. Uh, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Can I just kind of use today's modern verbiage? They keep throwing it in my face. That's, that's kind of the version. You know, God's, God's warned us, don't bring certain things before me. Don't even let me see those things. And what he is telling Jonah is they keep throwing things in my face. Their ways are so wretched. And we sit here and we, we can't even imagine sometimes those wretched ways because many of us were raised in church. We lived a life, and, and that's a beautiful life to live, but we lived a life unaware of many sad, tragic, wretched things that happen in the world today. Many of us, many of us in this room cannot remember the atrocities of World War II. We just can't. Can't, we, we know what the stories of Hitler were. We know about the six, the six million Jews that were, that were in the Holocaust. We know the stories, and, and if you've ever seen the videos, they're absolutely wretched. But we have it living out right before us today in Eastern Europe. The ways of man are incredibly wicked. And, and we can't, and, and honestly, we're shocked at what we're seeing on CNN or whatever channel, Fox or whatever you watch. Doesn't matter, they're all got a taint to it. But whichever one you watch, there is a, a, just a shock of what you are seeing because you can't believe that how could man be so evil? Well, that's what God was saying to Jonah. Now, if you know the history of the Ninevites, let me tell you, they were wretchedly evil to the people of Israel. That's their history. So under, I want to give you a little history there. It's not like there's a treaty with the people of Nineveh. Jonah was a Hebrew he truly did not like, nor did he tolerate because of the history of the people of Nineveh and how they treated God's people in the past, in the history. And so just so you know, that's the basic uh, history of the story. But Jonah ran away. Why? Because he did not want the mercies of God to go to Nineveh. Get the picture. He did not want God to be good to them the way God has been good to Israel. That's basically the story. Here it is. Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went to Joppa where he found a ship uh, bound for that port. Joppa, by the way, was a major port city. If you're not familiar with it, major port city. It was, used, it was actually mentioned much even in the New Testament. Uh, Simon the Tanner lived at Joppa. Peter went to stay at his house in Joppa there at, uh, at, at, at Simon's house on the sea. And so it was a well-known city and a great port city. So he went there to, down to Joppa where he found a, a, a ship that was bound uh, it, was, it was bound for Tarshish. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind out to sea, such a great violent storm that the ship threatened to break up. All of the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. Now, I, you got to know something. That was a day also where many expressed faith in unknown gods and, and different gods. And that was not uncommon in that day. Remember, uh, in Greece, Paul addressed at Mars Hill, Paul addressed a bunch of people that had worshipped multiple gods, in fact, even an unknown god. So that was very common back then. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, and I'm going to tell you the story for a little bit, and then I'm going to focus on where I want to go with this. Actually, where I want to focus is chapter 4, the last conversation that Jonah has with God before the end of the book. So Jonah goes down below, and the storm gets worse. This long story uh, goes like this. The, the sailors go downstairs. St they're trying to find out what's going on. The captain uh, approaches them and says, what is going on? What, what, what is going on? He said, basically says that they cast lots, and it fell on Jonah. They said, what's going on? Who did, who did you tick off? What did you do? What, what's going on? He said, it is my fault. I, it's my fault. I serve the God who created those very winds. Those created, he created those very uh, waves. I serve that God. And they were all afraid. They're like, what did you do to him? What did you do to wake him up like this? And he said, look, I know it's me. Just all you got to do is throw me overboard. And, and the, basically that'll solve the problem. And, and instead of doing that, they didn't want to take an innocent life, the, the story says. And, the, and, it, and they start rowing towards shore as hard as they can. Well, God sent more forceful winds and more forceful waves. And, and, and finally they realized they could not get back to shore. How many know you cannot wrestle with God. When God wants your attention, you cannot row hard enough to get back to safety. 
when God's pushing you back out and saying, you got to deal with me out here. You can't come to safety and deal with me. you got to go out there and deal with me, and you're going to stay there till you do. They finally gave up. They, they grabbed a hold of Jonah. They tossed him overboard. Uh, and, and, and literally, uh, let, me, let me take you to the next uh, chapter 2. They, uh, uh, the sea calms. Immediately the storm calms. And in chapter 2, Jonah begins to pray. Now, I want you to know something. I'm in prayer as they're grabbing me. <laughs> I, I'm, the, I, I'm the voice that's going, I'm just kidding, guys. I'm just kidding. Put me down. Don't throw me over. Because, you know, I don't want to drown, you know. But, and there's a lot of people who would say that, you know, that's probably what they would do too. But he, he, the Bible says he begins this amazing prayer. From the inside of the fish, God sends a fish. He created a fish for him. And the, at the end of that, chapter 1, it said God created a fish and placed it, Jonah in there for three days. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, and he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Now, I want you to notice this. Jonah is calling on the mercies of God. After he had been wicked and disobeyed God. Get the picture. After he had been wicked and disobeyed God and rejected God, in fact, tried to run from God and God's commands. And now he's calling out on the mercies of God. Aren't you glad that when you and I did that, God was merciful to you and to me too? Amen. And at the end of that chapter, and the Lord commanded, it says in verse 10, the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited the, the salvation. He de, the last thing he declared is salvation comes from the Lord. And that was the end of the repentant prayer. And the Lord commanded the fish and he vomited uh, 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 Jonah up onto the, uh, onto the beach immediately. Chapter 3, Jonah finally goes to Nineveh. Now, I, I'm on my way too. I would too if I had faced what Jonah had faced. But I, now, you got to understand, Jonah just experienced the mercies of God. At a level, he pleaded with God. He, was, he even admitted this, in my distress, I am going under here. I got seaweed around my neck. I got all that. I am dying here, Lord. Deliver me. Salvation. I need your salvation. He is begging for God's mercy, and God does give him that mercy. Y'all asleep, or are you awake? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Do you just like a story or what? <laughs> it's a great story. And then all of a sudden... He goes to Nineveh. He, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I have had the word of the Lord come to me many second times in my life. I, I'm just being real with you guys. We don't stand up here and act like that the pastor is any different than anybody else. I'm telling you, I have had the word of the Lord come to me a second time because I know what it is to say, nope. I was on my way to a meeting one time, a district meeting years ago, and I had in my mind everything I was going to say to somebody, or well, actually to five guys. And I mean, I had everything in my mind that I was going to say to those guys when I got to this district meeting. And some of you know the, the issues there, and, and I, I'm not going to tell you names, but I, I had to go handle a situation. And, uh, and, and so the district soup assured me, he said, don't worry, you're right, we get it, we know that, just, but we still need you to come and talk with these men. And I said, I, oh, I'll be there. I will be there. Believe me, I'll be there. And I started up Highway 63 after Columbia, and I was heading there. And about the time, I was telling the Lord everything I was going to say to these guys. I mean, everything I was going to say to these guys. And the word of the Lord came to Barry a second time. And he said, if you'll close your mouth, I'll close the mouth of the accusers. The word of the Lord came to Barry a second time. I can't tell you how many, this is my story. This is, how many know, this is our life story in the book of Jonah. It's an example of, of someone that actually really does love God. And God gives a command and expectation, and we fail God. In fact, we intentionally don't do what God has told us to do, especially when it comes to the harvest, because that's what this whole story is about, other than Jonah's walk with God and, and his repentance and, and the grace of God. This was about reaching into the harvest that, was, that, that God was, he was sending, here's the truth, he was sending Jonah on a mission trip. I have had people say to me when we come back from our missions trips, Pastor, I know I was supposed to be on that missions trip. And I, I, when I hear those words, I grieve, not for me. I grieve for two individuals, or I grieve, I grieve for the person who missed the opportunity to go in the name of the Lord. 
I, I, I mean, I grieve for that person because they miss the opportunity to, to be excited about and to pray about. God, prepare me to meet someone special when I get there. That's, that's what Jonah could have been praying the whole time when he was running from God. God, prepare me. I don't like these people. I don't really like these people, but I know that you love these people, and I know that you have mercy upon these people, and you want to bring truth and hope to these people. But no, we've done that so many times. That individual that has come to me, I'm, I'm broken for them because they miss the opportunity of anticipation of what God might say through them or do through them. I was on, uh, well, I, I was there, many of you were there when Cindy, uh, Cindy and Larry were on the trip. And after C uh, Larry had taken his, his double leap plunge off of a, uh, of a two-story house and landed on his head, and we watched Cindy pray Larry back to life in the emergency room. Was that John, St. John's or Mobab? Saint, it was Mercy, Mercy, Mercy Hospital, Mercy Hospital. I was in the emergency room when Cindy was laying, as the doctors were shaking their head over Larry. He's right back there. They're shaking their head over Larry. They, they basically called Cindy in to be there as he, as he went home. And I'm watching. They, they, there, was no, there was nothing there that proved that Larry was going to come out of. He was on a ventilator at the time. There was nothing that proved Larry was going to survive this. And the doctors are looking. I've seen those looks. I've been in those emergency rooms and in those uh, ICUs. I've been in those rooms when those doctors give looks. I was in the room when the one doctor looked, uh, or the nurse rather, looked at a doctor before they told me my brother had been killed. I know those expressions. I know those looks. And they're broken looks. They're, I don't want to do this looks. And, and, and this, so uh, Cindy laid across Larry's chest and she began to have a conversation with God. And she said, God, don't you take him from me. Don't you, don't take him from me. I need him here. I need him, Lord. I love him. Please, God. And I mean, she had a conversation where a wife a loving wife, godly woman, had a, a, a talk with God, and she touched heaven, and she reached into the heart of God, and God spared Larry's life and brought him back. He's sitting at the back door. He's, he's our, our, our maintenance guy here. He was with Anheuser-Busch for 19 years. This guy is, is, he's back. Larry's back. And I mean, that's an amazing story. Well, when Cindy was on the, yeah, give the Lord a hand. I say that because, because Cindy's on this missions trip with us, Cindy and Larry, and we were, and I was preaching in a church in Guatemala, Paline, Guatemala, Pastor Victor's church. I guess some of you guys were there at that church, Pastor Victor's church. And on one occasion, while I, during the message, I really felt compelled. Some of you ladies, and I told the story of Larry and Cindy, some of you ladies, you need to have that kind of, you need to touch heaven for your family. So I, I don't know what it is with your children or your relationship, your husband or, or, or what it is, but you need God to step in. You, you need God supernaturally to step in. And you would like for this woman, and Cindy. Now, how many of you know Cindy is not the most outgoing person to go up to the front of the church? She is not the If I ever said I need volunteers to come forward, Cindy would go. <laughs> Cindy's not the bold person that would come out and stand up here and do this, and, 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 and she's not that. She doesn't seek attention at all. She certainly doesn't want the platform unless she can, uh, if she can avoid it at all cost. And when I said, how many of you would like for Cindy to lay hands on you? I want you ladies, this is right in the middle of the message, I said, I want you ladies to come forward. And of course, I said this through an interpreter. I want you ladies to come forward, and I want you to line up. Cindy's just going to lay hands on you, and she's going to speak into you a faith and a power of God that could speak to God and touch the heart of God for your family. These ladies lined up. I mean, they got in line for, and, and Cindy, when I first said that Cindy's sitting in that chair, Cindy looks at me like, <laughs> she gave me that, I want to go to Tarshish, look. <laughs> Do you get the picture? She's got, I got, I want to go to Tarshish right now. God, beam me up, Scotty, because I want out of here. She gave me that look. And I said, come on, come on up here, Cindy, come on up here. And Cindy began to lay hands on those people and said, those ladies. And those ladies, some of those ladies, I mean, they're just available to whatever God wants to do. And they're, I promise you, Cindy doesn't push. Y'all know that? Cindy's not a push person. She, not, she would do this. She'd look at them like, they fell. <laughs> they fell. She, she's amazed they, 
they, God's using, and, and by the time Cindy got to the, to the end of the line, Cindy is praying boldly over these ladies. Cindy's actually praying boldly over these ladies. She's praying new things over these ladies. And I mean, I'm, I'm listening to her pray. And she's, and Larry, by the way, I think, Larry, did you join her back there? You don't, never mind. Like I said, he fell off a roof. So he doesn't have much of a memory. <laughs> What, what, hey, th- hey, what are we having for breakfast next week, Laird? No. So Cindy, it, but get the, op- get the picture. Cindy no more wanted to go there, but God called on her to do something out of what was comfortable. Listen, Jonah didn't want to go there because he didn't, he, this was not comfortable him, for him. I don't want to go to people who tortured my people. These people hate us. They're worse than Mets fans. Sorry, if you're watching in New York, that would be cardinal. It would be cardinal fans to you. It would be cardinal fans to you. But get the story. But get this. He goes there and he preaches, and the king immediately relents and repents, and he orders a, a, a time of sacrifice, and everyone, including animals, are to, are, are to, are, are to fast. There's, no one is to eat. Everyone is to wear sackcloth. Even the king derobed himself, put on sackcloth, and, and went outside away from the royal throne, and he sat in the dirt and repented before the people, and the people were following, and, and many agreed, and uh, in fact, that's what they did as a city. They repented before God. And this is what God's word says in when God saw that they did this and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion. He had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. That'd be like, (laughs) I mean, I, I can't get that for some reason. I can't get that. But uh, there are some that may truly understand that. But he became angry at God. He prayed to the Lord, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, God. Slow to anger. Yeah, you were for me. Yes, you were for me. Yes, you were for me. Yes, he was for you. But for people I don't like, I don't want to have compassion on those people. Slow to anger and abounding in love for me, for you, and for Jonah, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. What a selfish, after the grace and the mercies of God. Listen to me. Let me tell you. He's not getting it. He just pleased God the Creator. Because people are repenting. God has relented the calamity and all of the and destruction he was going to bring upon people. People. And he goes on to say, God's word says, there were 120,000 people in Nineveh. He, and so he, the long story short, Jonah goes out and, and he, he has a, a, a pity party out. And, and then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head and ease to ease his discomfort. He's still being, I'll tell you what he's doing. He's being compassionate towards Jonah, but he's playing with him a little bit. God, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows how the story's going to go. He knows exactly what Jonah's going to say, and he knows exactly what he's going to say to Jonah. Listen to this. He said it provided for his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at the, at, at, dawn, at the dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed up the vine, and so it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so, that the, so he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Now listen to this. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he says. I sure do. He said, I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you've been, concern- you've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend to it or you didn't make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has been more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. So shouldn't I have compassion on them? And, and so this is what we do. This is what we do. We live out the Christ life among believers. And when we're in the world, we so miss the opportunity to reach the Ninevites that God puts us. Because you see, we are not wanting to do that. We're not, I love this one. I'm not, you know, confrontational. When did giving hope to someone ever seem confrontational? 
then I certainly don't want you to say anything. If your method of giving Jesus is confrontational, you know the guy, remember the story of the guy up in Kansas City that I told you was standing on a milk carton out in the, the, the country club area at night and we were having dinner up there and he's standing on a milk carton, got a microphone in his hand and a speaker in, under the milk carton and he's screaming, y'all are going to hell! If that's giving Jesus, don't you dare give Jesus. That's the wrong, that is not a biblical Jesus. What about the church that stands at military graves and tells them all that all, all military are going to hell? Everybody's going to hell here. God hates you. Those are signs. You show me one scripture where God hates people of honor. But there's, so, there's such a messed up, so there's a messed up version of who Jesus really is. I, wanna, I want you to turn in your Bibles to, and this is what I'm going to close with, Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29, Ephesians 4, 29. I'm going to give you guys enough time to get there. And we're going to go through approximately uh, the rest of that chapter, verse 32. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. God wants us to go into the, into the world. When he sends us, let me tell you something. God gives you hot connections. Somebody said to me not long ago, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know how. I don't know about you know, inviting people to church. I can't invite people to the, and so there's such a focus down through the years of inviting people to church. I would, you know what, we've gotten that wrong down through the years. That's just the truth. We've gotten it wrong. We're inviting them to something that we haven't even proved matters to them. I would much rather we, because I believe this is the biblical model, that we actually invite them into our lives have connection with them at some level. And, and, and I'm talking about, I'm not saying have everybody over at your house, but have a, an intimate, constant connection with people where every time you're around them, you bring their day a little bit better. In fact, every time th that you walk into the room, they're glad when you entered the room and they tell you they hate for you to go. When a server's telling you, you don't have to get up and leave, stay. No, you're, ma you're making it better. I'm having a better day when you're here because you wouldn't believe what I'm doing with, uh, dealing with over at table six. You know, when, when, when you bring someone a brighter day, when you go into the Nineveh of the world, can I tell you what? Nineveh represents the lost world. Nineveh in this story, it just simply represents the lost world around us and the opportunity that God gives to each of us to go into our own Nineveh and actually make an impact through the love of Jesus Christ. Not a confrontational, you're a sinner, you're dying and going to hell. Listen, I, if, some of you may be offended at this, but I, Gina and I, and some of you have done this too, and I love this about you. Gina and I have been invited out to dinner by couples of multiple different lifestyles. And we sit there and we have the greatest dinners with them. We, we love, I love, I mean, there's one, there, there's one particular uh, gay couple that I, a male couple that I see here in, in the area every once in a while. When I see them, wherever I see them at a restaurant, I'll go over and I'll sit down next to them and I'll say, dudes, what are we eating today? And who's paying? <laughs> you know, who's paying? And, and I, I joke with them all the time and I'll pay. I will end up paying. But I joke with them. I want you to know that's... <laughs> That's who we're looking for. We're looking for people that just need people who know Jesus in their lives. And I'm not, I, listen, I know what God's word says about different lifestyles, but I also know what God's word says about me. And every, my whole bad self, what I could be without God is wretched. And I want you to know, I know that what I could be without God is wretched. So I don't point fingers. It's so easy for us to keep pointing fingers at other people. We got this big old plank in our eye. We, you know, we, we talk about the other people's problems and we got this big old issue in our own eye and it's just easier to keep the attention on other people's sin. We've gone out to dinner with those couples and we laugh and they've even said, we can't believe you would go to dinner with us. Well, we love you. You're like our kids. Some of them are like our kids. A couple of them even call us mom and dad and call us from different places and say, mom, just checking in with you. Dad, just checking in with you, seeing how you're doing. Can I tell you, we had a, we had a couple in here years ago, a, a, a lesbian couple that came here for, for three years and had children here. They, the one young lady had the children, wonderful young lady. They started on the back row. Kids were sitting next to them. They, would start, they started on the back row. Did you hear me? They started on the back row. About a year and a half, a year into their experience, they moved to the middle of the church, and their kids started going to kids' church. About the, you all know, some of you may know the story. The, they, they, the kids went to the kids' church. I would have been criticized by a lot of people because I didn't just go confront them. 
I mean, I'm serious. I would, have been, I would have been criticized by a lot of people, but we kept loving them. We kept loving them. The, the, Gina and the ladies of the church, just, you, you all just kept loving the ladies, hugging on them, loving on their children, kept loving on them, hugging on them. And, and it was just an amazing uh, relationship that we'd built with this couple. After a year and a, after three years, well, after, in the third year, they moved to the front row. They moved to the front row. Now, how many people know that I would have been criticized to allow on the front row? You know, well, let me tell you, that's exactly who I'm looking for on the front row. That's who I want on the front row. I want people that are desperately, and they're taking notes. Get this, they're taking notes. The problem isn't there that they're gay. The problem is they need Jesus. I'll, I'll let that all work out after they meet the real Jesus. And so, y'all get that? Now, I just may have lost some of you. Y'all may not come back next Sunday, but let me tell you something. So one day after church, these young ladies came to me right after, as I came off the platform and said, Pastor Barry, could we meet with you in the cafe? I said, sure. And no, like right now. I said, okay, let's go. So we went back to the cafe and, uh, and someone was taking care of their children for them. And these two girls sat there and just bawled. They just bawled and wept. And, and, and I, 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 was, I was taken back. I said, what's wrong? Hey, what's wrong? They said, you know who we are. And you know what we are. And you have loved us, and the ladies in this church have loved us and not judged us. You've been kind. You've been compassionate. You, you never once were unkind. No one in this church was ever unkind to us. We always felt, you actually made us feel at home. We felt safe here. And because of that, we listened to what you were teaching, and we realized something. Pastor Barry, this lifestyle is not God's life, a will for our life. And we're leaving the relationship as of today. The one little girl said, I'm going home to San Antonio, Texas. I'm taking the three children with me. And they were just weeping. They admitted they loved each other. They cared about each other immensely. But they knew that that was not God's plan for their lives. Not long ago, that was many years ago. Not long ago, I saw that young lady. She's actually back in the area. She's actually back here. I saw her out with, I don't know if it's her boyfriend or her husband. And I saw those kids grown up sitting in a restaurant, and I hugged each one of them, and it was the most beautiful reunion. Sometimes people, though, can't come back to the church that everyone knew that part about them. You understand that? And I get that. Sometimes it's just a fresh start is good for everyone, and not because I needed it, but because they just didn't need questions, and it's a safe thing to go find a new church home for them. This is what God's Word says in Ephesians. I'm going to close this. Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful to build others up according to their needs and that it may benefit those who listen. And then I'm going to stop there. I'm actually going to stop there. Did you catch that? The things that we say about people matter. What we say in public matters. What we say in circles matters of private conversation matters because they won't stay private. First of all, they're not going to stay private. What we say on Facebook so is not private. But we put it out there anyway. Not long ago, one of a, one, a leader in a church in this area, not a pastor, but a, a leader in the church, put on Facebook, went home, got mad at a neighbor, filled a trash bag with dog manure that had been on their lawn and put it up back on their neighbor's porch where it came from, and then went on Facebook and broadcast that she, and she used language that was unbelievably unbecoming to a believer. And I'm not ashamed of it. Last words. And she hit the sand. How tragic that we see Nineveh that way, that I would drop dog manure on their lap, in their porch, when we actually have the opportunity to go next door and show grace. Because why? Because God showed it to me first. I am the first recipient of the grace. Our message should be, can I tell you what God did for me? You know your story is the most important witness you'll ever give. Witnessing is not about, hey, you need Jesus. Witnessing is, I saw, felt, experienced the power of God. Can I tell you what God did for me? This is what I was before Christ, B.C., and this is what I am, A.D., and after A.R. 
after resurrection. This is who I am today. And I want to tell you who I was. And I see you're struggling with some things. Can I be a part of your life? Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine the Nineveh we would reach if we actually begin to have the compassion that God actually has for people? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of compassion on your behalf. Lord, it's not a thing we have to decide to be compassionate. If we know you, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's what your word says. It ought to be a natural, the natural component, the first, it ought to be one of those natural things that comes into a believer's life. Because when we've experienced God's compassion, oh my goodness, we're the greatest witness to say how it impacts our lives. Teach us to give it away with great compassion and great zeal in the name of Jesus Christ. And every believer said, amen. Give the Lord a huge hand. Will you do that? We thank you all for, for joining us online. Um, and as Pastor Barry said, if you're in the area, we would love to see you here next Sunday and, and join us in person. Uh, let's go ahead and stand and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for uh, the time we've had to be here, uh, the time you've given us to worship as we sang so much about your presence, Lord. And in recognizing that in the message that you gave Pastor Barry, that as we go out into this, this world, we go throughout our daily lives, you put people in our lives, Father, that we can reach for you. And, and as he said, it, it's not telling them they're going to hell or you know, that they need Jesus. It's just sharing what you've done for us and that we love them and we receive them and, and, and that we care for them, Lord, that they're seeing you through us, Father, and all that we do and that they want that relationship with you. So as we leave this place, Lord, we pray that, that, uh, that people will see that, they'll see you in us and that they'll want what we have, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.